Our next session is talk about the future of India-US economic partnership, and that is important to discuss. And we do have uh, some eminent uh, speakers who are engaged and who have been engaged on driving this relationship in a very strong fashion. Uh, I have uh, Nisha Biswal, the former Assistant Secretary. Now she's with the uh, Albright Stonebridge. Uh, we have uh, Marshall Bhutan uh, with Asia Society. Uh, Joel Hellman, Dean, Georgetown School of Foreign Service. Amita Pule, CEO of uh, IIPL. And then Sunil Sangai, uh, CEO of HSBC India. I, I think uh, we did have two weeks ago the Prime Minister of India visit U.S., and we heard a lot of warm feelings between the two countries. And if you look at the ambition of the two nations, it is to drive an economic relationship which is today at $115 billion to $500 billion. There are tremendous opportunities, but there are also tremendous challenges. While India focuses on making India, you also have a president who's talking about making America. While India focuses on trying to create jobs which are growing, uh, the demand is growing by 1.3 million jobs a month, uh, you have a president here who's trying to focus on creating jobs in the US. So the, the challenge is, is how do you basically converge opportunities and manage risk and conflicts together? And on that note, I would like to open the forum uh, with, with, with my colleagues up here and I'm going to ask, basically, we'll get into a, more of a dialogue rather than an opening statement. As I said, we have a paucity of time, and then we'll go from there. So the, I'm going to just come down to the chair itself and start with Nisha as my first question, because uh, Nisha drove the policy side between India and the U.S. and took, under the previous administration, a relationship to a much, much higher level. And so the question to you, Nisha, is, is when you look at the current scenario, do you see a tremendous momentum picking up, or do you see challenges still coming up, either from a price control on stents, on bits itself, or, or other aspect of the relationship? Well, thanks, Mukesh, and it's really wonderful to be here with the Asia Society and with IFA and FIKI. Um, I, I was uh, here uh, at the uh, FIKI um, um, IFA Business Forum uh, three years ago in Tampa, not here in New York, but in Tampa. And, you know, where the relationship has gone over these past three years is, is quite remarkable. And, you know, to answer your question, Mukesh, about uh, whether we see the glass half full or, or half empty, I mean, it's both, right? It, it is that there is tremendous momentum and incredible potential in this relationship. And so there's a reason why India has become um, the, the favored investment destination uh, for so many American companies and is right now uh, at the top. There's a reason why um, you are seeing you know, this, this active competition in the United States on the India relationship within government, within industry, on the Hill. Uh, it is India's moment. but. Let's not squander that moment either, because there are challenges that need to be addressed. There are challenges that uh, we, were, uh, we were focused on within the Obama administration, which are also going to be a very high priority for the current administration. And you refer to some of them. I mean, one of the reasons why we tried so hard to move on a bilateral investment treaty with India is because we know that for investment to flow in both directions, there need to be uh, an environment that safeguards and provides kind of the rules of the road, whether it's on tax liability and retroactive taxation where there's been a lack of clarity, although good signals have been sent, whether it's on repatriation of profits, whether it's on dispute resolution. These are really important factors that have to get addressed, and those are important for companies on both sides of that equation. Mm -hmm. So if we can focus on some of those challenges, and I know that the current administration is focused on these challenges, and get through that, then I think that the glass can go from being half full or half empty to maybe being three quarters full. So that's where I think the, the positive momentum um, <coughs> lies, is in addressing some of these lingering issues, which can then truly unleash 
uh, the trajectory and get us from 115 billion, where we are currently, to the 500 billion that uh, the Vice President uh, um, Biden talked about um, and that both countries have agreed to as kind of a, a goal and a target for growing this relationship. Thanks, Nisheb. I think if you look at this Prime Minister, he has focused a lot on structural reforms, uh, GST, demonetization, bankruptcy law. And, uh, but I think there is a skepticism on part of the Asian neighbors because the Prime Minister has conveyed the desire to join APEC. So the question which I'm going to raise to Marshall is, is, is India's participation in APEC, will, will it accelerate the reform? Or will it slow down the rest of the APEC as it tries to move into a much more open market economy? Thank you, Mukesh. I'm also delighted to be here. And thanks to my Asia Society policy colleagues uh, for putting this together along with Fiki and IFA. Um, Kevin Wright spoke in his remarks about APEC. And uh, he and I have worked together on this issue now for the last three years. And we are both convinced that APEC would be a win-win a win proposition over time for India and a win proposition over time for APEC members. I, I want to stipulate at the outset that it's important to remember that APEC is not a formal negotiating body. It is a, let's call it, to, to downplay it, a discussion group, <laughs> but a very important substantive sustained discussion group that has, has Kevin Rudd said, has allowed East Asian economies now for 26 <laughs> years plus to, um, to learn about the, the ways and means of global trade uh, and the, the requirements that each country must have to fulfill over time in order to enter fully the global trading system and benefit from it. Um, it does not require that nations come to the table prepared to commit to certain agreements. Yes, there is a culture of consensus in APEC. But actually, I learned in, in studying this issue that the consensus is a very loosely defined uh, and loosely pursued uh, objective in APEC, and often takes years to reach. So why, why should India be interested in APEC? Well, first and foremost, because India has found it very hard to bring itself to enter the global trading system in a meaningful fashion. We, we all know this to be the fact. India lags uh, other economies, even at this, these levels of growth, in terms of its participation in global trade. It has improved a lot over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, but there's still a long way to go. Mr. Modi's projects, like Make in India, will not eventually succeed unless India has access to the global value chains that now define global trade. Um, and that's uh, a process that requires understanding how those value chains work and how national governments and policies affect those value chains. APEC is an opportunity for India to learn about those global value chains, to be socialized, if you will, into them, including those officials, uh, particularly in the, in the Ministry of Commerce, who have been historically anti-trade. Let's call that uh, for what it is. So it is an opportunity of, trem of tremendous value to India. Similarly, on the APEC side, we've already heard about India's growth to date. It's uh, now the fastest growing major economy in the world. Um, APEC needs that access to that economy over time to continue its growth and its contribution to global trade. In addition, you have the Indian labor force, which is the fastest growing labor force in, the, in a major economy in the world today, which, which uh, the APEC countries also need access to. So to sum it all up, I think that it's an opportunity on both sides. And the, the reticence on both sides is a is seriously grounded in some concerns they have, but we have felt that there is much more opportunity over time, and they have to look over those barriers to see why APEC makes sense for both of them. Thank, thank you, Marshall. Uh, uh, Amita, you are, have the different story in the sense is you are investing in the US, in the infrastructure space. And, and why, why US? 
where you have more competition and why not India where the demand is much, much higher and the returns are much better? So um, it's, it's interesting because, and, and thank you for, for having uh, me here. I represent ILFS Transportation um, and I run their Americas market and um, ILFS Transportation has pioneered public-private partnership in India. We uh, started with the public-private partnership in the 90s, 1990s, and um, we feel that this market in the U.S. can learn from us, from India. Um, br we bring innovation, we bring methods of financing, um, and we have, we've been successful so far. We've been working with uh, the State Department of Transportation. We've been speaking to the federal government about best practices and innovation in public-private partnerships and how India can bring financing. Um, we, started, we started this uh, back in 2014, and today we add to the U.S. economy as an Indian company. By, um, we added 500 jobs to the U.S. economy just last year. We're bringing in capital from India into the market. And I think it shows um, that Indian companies have the wherewithal to play in this, in this market and that we can be part of the U.S. economy just as we want American companies to go in and be part of the Indian economy. And um, um, we're proud to say that we're the first Indian company to step into this infrastructure world in the U.S. And um, so far we've been doing quite well. So it's been a, a lesson learned of uh, the difficulties, the triumphs, the challenges that we face just as uh, American companies going into India are facing. And I think there should be some sort of roundtable discussion at some point as to how both the, the Indian companies can bring lessons learned and how American companies can take lessons back into India. We, we can do that. Um, <laughs> you know, it's interesting, last week there was an announcement by uh, SpiceJet they placed a $22 billion order on Boeing mm -hmm. and uh, creating roughly 104,000 jobs in the U.S. itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, the CEO was telling me that <coughs> the Indian civil aviation market is growing 25%. Yeah. Only 3% of the population is still only using civil aviation. So the growth potentials are tremendous itself. And I think most of the orders uh, hopefully will come to the U.S. companies and create more jobs. But coming back to infrastructure, there's a market opportunity of a trillion dollars in India. But what we're seeing is, is the Japanese and the Koreans, they seem to move much faster than the U.S. companies itself. So, Neil, from your perspective, why there is so much reluctance? Is it financing? Is it the market is not conducive enough? Or is there a lack of stability on the policy side that the U.S. companies are not coming on infrastructure side? That's a very good topic, and uh, thank you, Mukesh, for raising this, and I'm delighted to be here this morning. Uh, I was uh, listening to the inaugural panel very interestingly, and there was one word which was missing, uh, infrastructure. We talked about defense, we talked about multiple other sectors, but there is so much happening in the sector, infrastructure. You just talked about aviation uh, this morning um, as I was uh, clearing my emails and uh, watching news. Uh, there is a very remote place in Bihar called, I don't know if any one of you here will be aware of a place called Purnia, Darbhanga, got connected with uh, air connectivity this morning. Oh. So that's what is happening. That's the reason why aviation is growing 25% uh, uh, really year on year because uh, smaller places are getting connected and that's the reason why SpiceJet and Jet and uh, others are really growing. But coming to infrastructure in general, I guess uh, what has happened, if you look at the past, uh, the consumption market of India has been targeted by the global corporations, particularly the U.S. corporations. In fact, we, we, we always talk about that we get up with Colgate and we sleep with Goodnight. Uh, so we, uh, you know, look, Colgate, Colgate is a classic example of how they have tapped into Indian consumption market. It's an 80 years old history and they capture almost 60% of the toothpaste market share. I see the same thing happening in infrastructure also. 
<coughs> GE has moved in in a big way. They've just got a very big uh, contract uh, to manufacture locomotive. So I guess this will happen across. What has to really follow along with this is the financing. The infrastructure, you really need long-term financing, which Japanese and Koreans are doing. They're actually financing their project as well as they're supporting their companies as well. And I see that uh, on, on the financing side, we've seen uh, American companies and American investors, they have actually invested in a big way in the equity. The first asset management uh, company to come in, in India was Mong Stanley, an American company. Uh, today, out of $2 trillion market cap of the Indian capital market, 25%, almost $500 billion owned by foreign investors, and significant part of it is owned by the American uh, investors. But they have not really come in in the same way in the debt market. And I see that is the area uh, which will grow as we grow the infrastructure. Great. Thank you. Let me just come to Joel, then we'll have an open discussion here. 162,000 Indian students in the U.S. contributing roughly $5 billion in tuition fee. But more important, a lot of them go back as goodwill ambassadors of U.S. back into India. And, uh, but a lot of them come to U.S. because there's opportunity to get ROI on the investment, especially on the optional training program and beyond itself. The current administration, you know, uh, executive order and some perception uh, of, of limiting that, where do you see that going and the impact on students coming to the U.S. from India itself? Well, thank you, and thanks very much for having me and for bringing up the important topic of the importance of higher education as a bedrock mm -hmm. of the relationship between the United States and India. Because I do think, first of all, it's one of the most prominent important aspects of the American, America's brand globally is the attractiveness of its higher education system. And India, of course, has been partaking of it with the second highest number of students here um, registered in the United States. We have over a million students um, from abroad. India, as I said, second largest. Um, but with still quite a bit of room to go, China, for example, has uh, nearly twice the level, over 350,000 students um, coming in. So we still think there's plenty of room um, to attract the best and the brightest. It does a remarkable, it builds a remarkable foundation uh, for economic, social, political relationships across the countries because our best universities in the United States now, and there are many of them, are truly global institutions. Our faculty are global. Our administration are global. The number of Indian um, presidents of major American universities, business schools, and others is, is stunningly large. Uh, and uh, essentially, the student body now has become increasingly international. Um, and that's building relationships um, that will pay um, and bear fruits in so many sectors. Of it. Um, but as you point out, we have seen, and it's still early days to see what the impacts are, um, but two areas, the visa restrictions that obviously were not directed towards India in any shape or any way, shape, or form, but nevertheless seem to suggest perhaps a change in America's attitude towards its openness and willingness to accept international students. Um, and because India is such a large, makes such a large portion of that, you saw a dramatic drop in applications this year from Indian students. And that concerns us, because here's a policy not directed towards Indian students, but nevertheless creates a mindset, perhaps, or a worry that, that the welcome mat is not uh, as open as it always has been. And if st students were targeted from one country or the other now, what makes it, what guarantee is that we're not going to be targeted later on? So um, we've seen a dramatic drop um, in applications. Uh, and I hope that that's just a temporary blip um, and not sort of more of a longer term trend. The second thing we've seen, and I, wanna, I, I do want to place this on the table because it has, a relation, it has an impact on the economic relationship, is that 85 to 90 percent of the students coming from India um, are in, majoring in science tech business. Um, and of course that's a good thing because it does have, as you say, an ROI. Um, but on the other hand, what we're starting to see now that our universities have become global is if you can start to build up a financial aid base um, from charitable giving, from philanthropy, from corporate giving, and others, 
you're starting to, you'll start to see a, a wider range of subject matters covered in American universities. And I think for India as an actor and a player on the world, that's important. Because if you start to see students moving into the social sciences and humanities, as well as science and, and, and engineering, you're going to see a stronger cotter of Indian officials, Indian global players, Indian multilateral players. And I think building up that base, that philanthropic base, for ensuring Indian leadership in the world, I think is really important. Great. But, you know, I'm going to come back to Nisha and Marshall. Uh, you know, America first. Is that closing the waters? Is that anti-global trade? And will that have an impact on his partnership with India from an economic perspective? Nisha, you and then Marshall. You know, it all depends on how you define America first. American foreign policy has always been about advancing the U.S. national interest. But it's always been about drawing that national interest in the broadest possible terms, which is that when you extend security and prosperity uh, more broadly, you create conditions that advance America's interest in being able to uh, secure its borders and being able to advance its economic interests. I think uh, in, uh, in, in 2013, uh, President Obama, in his address to the Australian Parliament, talked about the Asia-Pacific century and the vital interests of the United States as an Asia-Pacific nation. Right? And he talked about how increasingly America's security and America's prosperity is going to be determined by how Asia grows in peaceful ways and in ways that create more opportunity for American companies. And we talked about the you know, infrastructure market. But virtually every market that you can think of, uh, whether it's the energy market, whether it's the technology market, whether it's consumer goods, India is going to be a dramatic opportunity. And so an America first policy that is written large and broad and inclusive talks about how America advances as we partner with and grow with uh, other countries. A narrowly drawn vision of America first that pits America's growth against uh, opportunities uh, of, of our, our friends and partners around the world is going to create a much more antagonistic approach. And that's not to say that there are not tough issues of, of trade barriers and, and, and you know, um, uh, that need to be addressed, but it's that more inclusive approach will actually, I think, create more opportunity for the American people as it does for the Indian people. Mm -hmm. Marcia? Well, let's maybe start by picking up on what Nisha just talked about. And of course, a key Obama initiative to help advance that partnership with Asia was um, the, the uh, trade agreement that was reached. Um, and uh, uh, TPP, known as the, 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 by that acronym. Um, and now, the irony is, of course, that India actually shared some, some reservations or actually concerns about, about TPP, feeling that, fearing that it would be um, kept outside the global trading system by TPP. But the irony was that, further irony was that TPP actually was, a, was not a trade agreement in the traditional sense. It was an agreement that would, that would uh, cause the countries, our partners in the, in the agreement, to raise their labor standards, their to change their regulatory standards in such a way that would benefit American, the American economy over time. So we have a, an, odd, an odd circumstance here in the U.S.-India relationship. I do not believe that, that America first, even broadly defined, um, necessarily excludes India in any way. To the contrary, that uh, we have a great interest in bringing India closer to us, and, and they have the same with, with respect to us. But the trade issues are going to be problematic in this relationship, depending upon how, how uh, avidly they're pursued by the Trump administration. The summit was a bit of a good sign, very early sign, that the two sides had chosen to paper over um, in largely positive ways, uh, whatever discussions went on about the trade issues. 
But at some point, this will become an issue uh, for, for both governments. I hope that the Modi-Trump partnership will, will result in the lifting of sites on both sides, much as happened under the Bush administration to bring about civ the civilian nuclear agreement and the Obama administration to bring about a, an unexpected agreement on climate issues, that these two governments, these two leaders will reach beyond that and see an opportunity to build an U.S.-India economic partnership that is the true partner of the security relationship between the two countries. Thank you, Marshall. Let me just come to uh, Sunil and Amita. I think a lot of U.S. companies still complain about transparency in policy making in India. Uh, they complain about things not improving on ease of doing business itself. And, and I would say uh, more important, uh, for example, recent price control on stents well, was kind of a setback to these companies. And when you look at, you know, we have a company which we convinced them to set up a, a brewery in Bihar, and after they set it up, there was a prohibition, and all of the investment went down the drain itself. So the question is, is are we seeing more transparency, more consistency, and, and better ease of doing business, or is it just only talk itself? So then, then tell me then. Look, I think the politics is same everywhere, right? So there is a bit of politics involved in a lot of decision making and that's the reason, with the example which you took Bihar, prohibition in Bihar uh, clearly has, it would taken a lot of us by surprise. But broader issue, Mukesh, is that the consumption, the size of consumption in the market is so large that despite some hiccups, I think there will always be a huge opportunity. We're talking about $1.6 trillion consumption market, which is growing significantly. Uh, our, and we've seen in the last 10 years, our per capita income growing from $800 to $1,900, $2,000. That itself has shown the way the consumption bucket grows. So this is the consumption is so large that I think it will be very difficult for any large global corporations not to really participate in that market. Having said that, yes, uh, there are issues which have been talked about uh, over a period of time. But I, I guess the, the focus on digitization is clearly taking away some of these issues in a big way. And we have started realizing, when it was getting implemented a couple of years ago, probably we did not feel, but now we are feeling it. Just one example I'll give you. There is a, which you know, people out here in this part of the world is very familiar with, and therefore I'm using that example, is just the disconnection between you as an SSC and your assessing officer, which is a, the income tax officer. Uh, that is a big change in India. I do not know who my income tax officer is, which wasn't the case till last year. That's a very <coughs> big change, and it'll bring about a big social change, the corruption and all of that. So those are the kind of things which are now happening, and I guess these are, this will go down in a very positive way. Great. Amit? I agree. I think that uh, India <clears throat> is uh, some, of the, some of the ways from just from the simple submission of bids and how the bids are being analyzed, and you're starting to see transparency in that world, side of the world, and um, uh, more from an from infrastructure perspective, um, the opening of the market to these other countries has become more and more significant. And we found that our company alone uh, partners with any, a number of American companies as we bring them into India and guide them through the, the transparency process and guide them through the uh, procurement process because it is somewhat uh, large and hard to understand when you first come in, but um, we feel that it's improving as time has gone on. Let me open uh, the question to uh, all of you. You know, you have what you call as uh, a prime minister who is driving a very strong economic agenda. Uh, he also is trying to manage his what I call is the other political wing, RSS, which has an impact on the social agenda also. Uh, 
do you see from a U.S. perspective uh, the social agenda having impact on the investment coming into the country? Open to any one of you. Yes. Well, if, if I can make one point on that, because it, it echoes also a point that Sunil uh, raised, which is the, the transformation of the consumer market and the social programs and the social agenda um, that uh, the Prime Minister is pursuing. I, I think that if we think structurally about what's happening in the global economy, the, the tremendously rapid reduction of, of, of the extreme poor, poverty reduction in India, is probably one of the most important sort of structural shifts in the global economy. India um, had 25 years ago, 50% of its population living under a dollar, under $2 a day, essentially. That's been halved in 25 years, which is an extraordinary 250 million people brought out of poverty. With the social problems and the social agenda and the focus on social issues, um, there's still, though, 20% of the Indian population, so about 270 million people who are living below the consumption line. That they, They're not consumers. They're just, they're just they're, their basic uh, food needs are being covered. So if we continue to see efforts to deal with the inequality gap, social programs that are trying to lift people out of extreme poverty, that is going to fuel not only something that will change India, but will have a, a, a really perceptible shift on the global marketplace by bringing potentially another 250 million consumers in the short period of time onto the global market. So I think there is certainly not just in India, but around the world right now, um, a certain level of nativism, <coughs> nationalism, both economic and, and uh, um, cultural nationalism that is at the fore. Um, the challenge, I think, for India, as it is for America, is that while these issues don't necessarily reflect the views of the majority of the population and don't reflect the reality of the majority of the population, they dominate the media and social media and then become the perceived reality. And that then impacts um, the longer term kind of uh, confidence that people have in the economic um, markets and the political stability. Even though that's not the reality on the ground, the perception <laughs> becomes the reality. And that's what I think the danger is for the US and for India, is to manage more effectively these perceptions that are being created. There is a distinct difference between the reporting of the Wall Street Journal and, say, the New York Times. Um, but they both inform the readership and create the overall perception. Mm -hmm. And you've got to manage both sides of that ledger. India can't just be uh, doing good things on the economic side and not manage some of these other perceptions that are being generated and that are being created. And the other point I would just make, you know, to put all of this into context, is um, what often gets left behind as we, as we look at the, the headlines is putting them into the Indian context and trying to understand uh, the, the size and the scope of the challenges against the backdrop of the larger Indian context, both in terms of, of um, what how large of an issue it is in the, in the scale of India, but then, you know, the challenge of, of, of governance capacity in many of these places where you're, where you're seeing some of the, uh, the issues come up. And, and so understanding that context and, and, and understanding where it fits in is, is important. But again, you know, the media perceptions often will end up driving uh, how uh, how the business community also senses the political stability side of the equation. And, and so I think that's something that needs to be more effectively managed. Unless it's fake media. <laughs> Marshall? Yeah, I just wanted to, to pick up on things that both Joel and Nisha have said. Um, the, uh, I, have a, I have great faith. I've been an India watcher, um, a deep India watcher for 53 years. Um, 
And I have learned to have great confidence in the ultimate common sense of Indian society uh, and institutions. And that's one of the great benefits, among other things, of yeah. its democracy. Um, I am convinced that, that if the prime minister should, and I don't think he will, but should unfortunately choose to, to pursue a, a, a cultural slash religious um, line in the run-up to the next elections, he will find his majorities in the Lok Sabha reduced. Because that kind of appeal, political appeal, may have, may work in certain parts of the country, but it won't work overall. And it won't work in the increasingly large and influential middle class, urban middle class of the country. And then you have institutions like the Supreme Court saying, no, no, you can't do these things. So it, along the way, there will be problems and concerns, and we should all take them seriously. I'm not suggesting we shouldn't. Um, the biggest challenge, in my opinion, if I may add, for Prime Minister Modi, is that he ran in 2014 for the first time in the history of independent India. He ran not on a welfare platform, but on an economic growth and job creation platform. <coughs> He responded to the aspirations of Indians of all ages and all regions of the country to a desire to make their lives better and, and the lives of their families and them better. If he is unable to begin the process of creating the jobs that will absorb those 1.3 million uh, labor force, new labor force entrants a month, as Shikanka mentioned earlier, he's got a problem. Now, he has very strong politically, but he will have a problem in 2019 and later. So that's why the economic issues we're talking about are so central to all of this. Can I just add Thank one you. very yeah. brief point? Just, uh, you know, uh, and it's in a, important in the context of the, what investors are thinking, how are they looking at this issue. And I tell you, in the last three years, we have been number one uh, foreign direct investment uh, manager in India in, as, a, as an advisor and I worked in most of those deals and currently also we are working on multiple transactions about billions of dollars. Not in a single conversation, not even a single conversation, a social issue ever really surfaced. Even if we are doing a multi-billion dollar deal for a global corporation investing in India, whether this issue, forget about in the forefront, whether it's there on the table is being discussed, it's never been there. So I think it's more of a perception than the reality. That's great. I, I need to uh, wrap this up. I'm seeing signs, two minutes and less. Uh, I'm going to just gonna ask one closing question, 30 seconds to each one of you to answer it. You know, what is one thing we can drive from the U.S. side to drive the growth agenda from the economic perspective and what is one thing you want to see from India's side to drive that growth agenda on the economic side? Starting with Joe. Well, I'll, I'll take the education sector because it's obviously most critical to me. And it's, it's dealing with the visa and H-1B-1 issues to, to, to give long-term prospects for an investment in education in the United States for Indian students, which I think the visa regime is really <coughs> impacting that. On the Indian side, I actually think it is building up the corporate power and philanthropy that will ensure a more uh, wide and diverse range of students from across India getting the opportunities um, <coughs> to engage not only in the United States but, but elsewhere in education. Thank you. Amrit? I think uh, from the U.S. side, um, the, the, there's a lot of money that could be invested into the Indian infrastructure and it is a matter of um, of helping them understand some of these issues and, and clearing some of the regulations and bringing more transparency. From the Indian side, I think um, uh, Indian companies have so much to offer to the U.S. in terms of innovation, how they were able to um, begin to do things with very little and how they've grown. And I, and I think that that type of lessons learned um, background in terms of how they were able to navigate through some of these issues should be brought to the table. Thank you. Marshall? Um, our two governments uh, should um, make sure 
that our economic differences, which are there and will take work, um, do not get in the way of the larger relationship. And to me, that was the most positive outcome of the summit. I was clear that the, the larger context of the strategic partnership um, was, being, was being shielded from any, from any differences. But over time, those economic differences will tend to limit the capacity of the strategic partnership to grow further. And I hope that uh, President Trump and Prime Minister Modi have the vision and imagination to see beyond the current differences and try to build a different kind of economic relationship. Thank you, Marshall. So, so uh, from Indian side, actually, it's fresh in my mind because I spent some time, uh, visited uh, the Valley earlier this week, and I realized that one out of six innovators uh, is an Indian. Right. So if we can take some of them back home, so that's something which we should do. We should incubate, we should actually innovate, do new businesses. Uh, from the U.S. side, uh, since we talk about infrastructure in the long term, we, we have been talking about the newer things. I think there's one sector which is again missing. Uh, where we haven't seen a significant U.S. investment into India is real estate. Maybe because the sector was closed and now it has opened up completely. Uh, I think this is one sector, as the economy grows, will grow very significantly and we should see more U.S. investment. Great. Thank you. So, I'm going to go back on to the innovation piece in terms of India, what lessons India can take away. And it's not to bring the um, innovators and entrepreneurs who have succeeded in Silicon Valley back to India, but how do you create that ecosystem in India? Yeah. What is it that allowed a Silicon Valley uh, to come into being? And how has it, you know, that, that juxtaposition of, um, of research and, and um, you know, academic excellence and the, the economic ecosystem that then allowed those innovations to then um, uh, both uh, pilot and scale. And how do you create that in India? Why is it that Indian startups are looking to extricate rather than to scale within India? And I think that that's something that I know the Prime Minister is focused on. I know that, um, that the government is trying to see how they can make uh, these kinds of hubs across India. Uh, in terms of what the U.S. Uh, can take away, I'm going to go back to another side of my brain, which is on the development side, which is that India is the laboratory for how you address massive challenges that exist in our world today on poverty, on health, on literacy, on virtually every, every arena that you can think of. India is a development <clears throat> laboratory. And how we address challenges um, in India will inform how the world addresses them. So I think that there's enormous opportunity uh, for partnership um, in, in, in that arena for the U.S. and India for global benefit. And I think both the Prime Minister um, of India has, has really uh, articulated this in a, in a very compelling way, which is that the U.S.-India partnership is not about what we can do for the Indian people or the American people, but how we together can uh, transform the challenges facing the world. Great. Thank you very much. A round of applause for the panelists. Thank you.